John Piper uh, wrote this series called The Swans Will Not Be Silent, and one of the series titles is called Contending for Our All. And the introduction to the series of contending, or into the, the segment of Contending for Our All, this is what he writes. Now this is just the introduction, so I would encourage you all to go check out Piper's Swans Will Not Be Silent series, but this is the introduction for the one Contending for Our All. He says, there are more immediately crucial tasks than controversy about the truth and the meaning of the gospel. For example, it is more immediately crucial that we believe the gospel and proclaim it to the unreached and pray for power to attend the preaching of the gospel. But this is like saying that flying food to starving people is more immediately crucial than the science of aeronautics. True, but the food will not be flown to the needy if someone is not doing aeronautics. It is like saying that giving penicillin shots to children dying of a fever is immediately, more immediately crucial than the work of biology and chemistry. True, but there would be no penicillin without the study of biology and chemistry. In every age, there's a kind of person who tries to minimize the importance of truth-defining and truth-defending controversy by saying that prayer, worship, evangelism, missions, and dependence on the Holy Spirit are more important. Who has not heard such rejoinders to controversy? Let's start, stop arguing about the gospel and get out there and share it in a dying world. Or prayer is more important than argument. Or perhaps we should rely on the Holy Spirit and not on our own reasoning. Or God wants to be worshipped, not discussed. We love the passion for faith and prayer and evangelism and worship behind those statements, but when they are used to belittle gospel-defining, gospel-defending controversy, they bite the hand that feeds them. Christ's exalting prayer will not survive in an atmosphere where the preservation and explanation and vindication of the teaching of the Bible about prayer hearing God are devalued. Evangelism and the world missions must feed on the solid food of well-grounded, unambiguous, rich gospel truth in order to sustain courage and confidence in the face of affliction and false religions. And corporate worship, what we are doing here this morning, will be diluted with cultural substitutes where the deep clear biblical contours of God's glory are not seen and guarded from the ever encroaching error. So this morning we come and begin our series in 1 John taking a brief hiatus from our lengthy study of the gospel of John. So I'm sure that as we are looking at the letter of First John, taking a break from the Gospel of John, we're able to duck together this morning that they have the same author. John wrote them both. However, we're going to be looking at an altogether different type of writing, addressing a different issue that the people are facing here. As we look and have been diving into the Gospel of John, we have been reminded each and every week of the recurring theme that John has been laying out from us, a compelling message to see Jesus, to see all of Jesus, to see the King in his glory, the glory of the King and the deity of Jesus, to see the King in his glory and to believe the Gospel, to stop going about this life living in ways of tradition or ways of self preservation. To rather look at the king, look at Jesus, look to God, and to be filled, to see the glory, to see the goodness, and to believe in him. Not because of a, a feel-good thing, but rather because he has come. That's what we see in the Gospel of John. We, we see that John is teaching us, he's telling us that Jesus has come. He has come. He has come in the flesh. He has dwelt among us. He has taught us. He has restored us through his life, through his death, and ultimately through his resurrection. And this is the good news. This is the gospel. This is the most compelling message of all. The good news for all to believe, to see Jesus as the greater Moses, to see the need to be freed from our slavery. And what is our slavery? Our slavery is our slavery to sin, the slavery that all of us are compelled by. And we need to get the slavery not just out of us. We don't need to just hear a message. We don't need to have a mental assent to the 
the gospel. We need to get the slavery out of us. So today, as we come to the, the letter, the epistle of 1 John, we will notice quickly that the message, this style, and the audience is altogether different. It's altogether different between 1 John and the Gospel of John. There are some key things that we need to point out as we begin our introduction here into this letter. We can notice immediately that there are going to be no introductory statements in these first four to five verses. There's no identification of the author. There are no greetings here. It's very unlike the letters that we find from Paul, the letters that we find from Peter, and even that of James. For that matter, it just jumps in immediately into the issue. John writes, writes, what was from the beginning, but what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we behold, or even looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. This is a book, and what we're going to see time and time again, about the word of life. And John says, I am writing it from a very personal experience. I have heard it, I have seen it, I have looked deeply into it, I have handled it with my own hands. Think about this. John was one of the disciples. He was one of perhaps the sons of thunder who was closest to Jesus. He was there. He was present at the, at the moment of transfiguration. He was there. And at the time that he writes it, it's the last decade of the first century. So he's writing this from a, from a perspective that's sitting back. He's become older in his age. And so when you're thinking about this, if you're in your 70s or 80s, John is writing that from, from that perspective. He's been there. And so now he's watching the, the subsequent generations come along and so he's writing this from a position saying I was there I have been there I saw it I walked with Jesus I was there at the raising of Lazarus from the dead I was there at the feeding of the 20 plus thousand people I was there when Jesus came walking across the water I was there when Jesus kept saying my hour has not yet come I was there I know it from a first hand experience I was there when they put Jesus on the cross I was there when Jesus walked through the walls and had dinner with us after the resurrection. I was there. This is an apostle who is still alive and has a vital, vibrant ministry to the churches of Asia Minor, and he's preaching and teaching and leading the churches through his writing, through his preaching ministry, and he's writing this from a perspective saying, there's a message and there's a ministry, not that just needs to continue happening, but there's a gospel message that needs to be alive and well. When we go back to what Piper just told us in the continuum from our all, there's a gospel message that we cannot risk being diluted down, not in the first century, in the, in the last 10 years of the first century, there's a gospel message that we can't risk being diluted down in 2018 because when we risk it being diluted down, we end up with cults who saying Jesus plus something equals eternity and we know Jesus plus something equals eternity away from God. It doesn't equal eternity with God, it equals eternity apart from God. We see it when we look at the Mormons, we see it when we look at Jehovah's Witnesses, we see it when we look at any number of cults that are present and alive and well and growing exponentially in our day. Jesus plus anything equals eternity away from God. Jesus plus the gospel equals eternity with the King. That's the message, and that's the message that John is seeking to preserve in the, le the first epistle, the second epistle, and the third epistle, which is only one chapter. So, I mean, if you're looking to memorize the whole book of the Bible, say, hey, I memorized the whole book of the Bible, look at second and third John, you'll do it rather quickly. I mean, it's one of those easy things. If you're going to start in Romans, well, then you're just out of luck. I mean, but if you're looking for an easy memorization of the whole book of the Bible, just go with second and third John. But John is writing as a pastor to his people, and he knows his people. Think about this. Pastors are, are, know their people. They know the struggles. We know when people are sick. We know when people are struggling. He knows his people and he knows his congregations. He knows the issues they are facing. And they're facing persecution, the infiltration of the false teachings. They're facing discouragement. And some of the significant themes that John will be reminding the church will be to remember Jesus. First and foremost, remember Jesus. Remember the first love. Remember the source of their salvation. And remember what salvation is. Remember the gospel. To hold fast to the joy that is found ultimately and only in Christ. And to seek the true fellowship and the only fellowship that matters that comes through and that is found in the kingdom. And so as we come to 1 John, we come back to John who is teaching us again about Jesus. Just as he did in the gospel, but now he's doing it in the epistle, but he's doing it now as a pastor. And I keep using the words pastor here intentionally, for here in this letter we will find a heart that is madly in love with God. 
He's madly in love with God and a heart that is madly in love with the church. But we also find a heart that issues, and that is going to issue some stern words. This summer as we begin this series, uh, and just like we did last summer in 1 Peter, as we look at this, we're going we're gonna to have some, some, some issues that are going to arrive as we study this. And, and, and I pray, and I've been praying, that God would purge our hearts of things that don't need to be there. Purge our minds of things that are, that are infiltrating our minds or our hearts that are, that are keeping us from seeing the fullness of the glory of God or keeping us from being a church that experiences the fullness and the glory of God the way he's defined it to be. When you look at Matthew 6 and he says, pray this way that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we'd fully experience, not just say it, but experience the fullness of what that means. You know, when we think about this, we, we would need to open our hearts to allow God to, to see and expand, but not just see and expand, but to purge the things that don't need to be there. Perhaps there are things that have become callous, because we look at this, many of us in this room have been followers of Christ for a long time, but when, we, when we've been doing something for a long time, calluses develop, and we begin to think, well, this is just how things are. This is just how the culture is. This is just how the church is, because of culture because of blank because of this is how people are even disciples sometimes lose their way we go back to the debate in acts when when peter and paul are debating of how do we share the gospel most effectively and we say well this is just how things are or perhaps god needs to come into us as a people and say that's not how i want to use you most effectively in this moment and so this this summer i pray that we would allow God to purge the callousness in us to seek and to see the kingdom come. And so perhaps you're saying, why are we going to go through parts that are not all rosy? This is summer, is it not? It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be happy. It's supposed to be pretty. I mean, pretty in the desert still pretty, but it's supposed to be pretty. And we look at this and we think about how do we ex show and experience the most love? And if you're a parent or a grandparent, you know that you display the most love when you correct Right? Because correction is loving because you, you protect your children and your grandchildren from doing things that will ultimately cause harm. And so even in First John, we see that John is going to be issuing perhaps stern words. We're going to find that that is showing great love. We remember James and we remember um, the letters of Paul when he's showing correction and James oftentimes stern correction. Remember that that's making us complete. It's making us more like Jesus so that we can understand and see the kingdom in its fullness. The way we live life in respect to the kingdom of heaven is ultimately of great importance here on this earth because that's how we understand when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I commanded. It's important it's important because Jesus sent us out with that mission, with that purpose. So with that being said, we open up to 1 John 1, 1 through 4. And here we open up in verse 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and we have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life that was manifest, which we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you eternal life eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. And so we look at these two verses alone, these two verses right here, this opening statement from, from Pastor John, and we come to this verse 1 and the significant theological statement that reminds us of the opening of the Gospel of John. And here he's reminding this to the churches and he's establishing the necessity to address what is apparently being debated in the church. This is being debated in the church, the deity of Christ. We would miss the point of what John is saying here and perhaps the point of the gospel if we don't go back to John 1.14 and remember the parallel passage that he's opening the gospel of John and opening the epistles and saying, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. Notice the parallels here. It's not a coincidence. It's not something that's to be found lacking, but he opens these two the same way for a purpose because this is the whole of the gospel. The whole message of the, of the covenant of Eve in Genesis 3.15 hinges on the promise that one is going to come who is going to crush the head of the serpent. Right? That's ultimately important to who we are and how we live. That one is going to come who's going to crush the head of the serpent. This is what all of biblical history is looking forward to. This is what we desire when we come to Genesis 6. Remember Genesis 6 when God said he's not going to contend with the hearts of men because they're evil continuously? 
He, this is what we look forward to. This is what we desire in Genesis 9. After Noah opens the door to the boat and they all come off the boat. And what happens there? Noah and the sons go back into sin. So even after the destruction of the planet through the water, we see they come off the boat and they go back into sin. They, they exit this. And this is what we desire time and time again as we hear the promise of the covenant relayed through Abraham, the promised child, uh, the promised child who will be a blessing to all nations. This is the covenant. This is the promise. This is John 1.14. This is the first John 1. The birth announcement of the king we see in Abraham. As we, and again, as we watch David fall the giant, we are not reminded of how great man is. It's not about man, but it's the reality that a great God is coming to crush the head of the serpent as the throne is lost from Solomon. Remember, Solomon had all the wives. He was just distracted. He lost sight of the kingdom. And so he loses the throne. But we remember the promise of second century. Samuel 7, that the throne, the kingdom will be established forever. And again, we're reminded that this is not about people. It's not about people. So therefore, it's not about us. It's not about what we can do or how we can do things better, how crafty that we can be or how much we can accomplish. But it's about how God is orchestrating his divine plan of redemption for all people so that they will know that he is king. He's king. It's not about monarchs. It's not about presidents. It's, not, it's about him being king. It, in this, he was not created. John is laying out here that which was from the beginning. In verse 1, the first few words before the comma, that which was from the beginning. We understand here, he was not created when the angels were created. He was not created when the earth was created. It was from the beginning. He is pre-existent of all. He is not just part of God. He is all of God. And here's a massive, massive point for all of us who are believers in this room. This is our assurance for salvation. For That says in Ephesians 1, for that even before time began, our salvation was secure through him. Okay, maybe your neighbor's going to sleep. This is the point at which you're waking them up. Our salvation was secure in him even before time began. Hello? Like, that's good news. Because we sure mess it up when we show up on the scene, you know what I'm saying? We can't handle driving down Patterson without getting mad at somebody and sinning. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? That, that, those 12 red lights, they put 1,400 red lights between, between the Starbucks down there and 28 Road down here, and you're like, every, you hit every one of them, and you're like, you're sinning all the way. You're like, <laughs> but the good news is, Ephesians 1.4 says, even before time began, our salvation was secure. Oh, yes. Good stuff. We don't need that many red lights out there. <laughs> put a highway in. That's why I don't do traffic control. As we come to 1 John, let us see this. Let us understand the gravity of the words that John is writing to the church as the last living disciple. Get this, he's the last one who's alive. So he kind of has this burden to hold it all together until he dies. He's the last one. All the rest of them have been martyred. They've had terrible deaths. And he's the last one. And he's coming to this message as a man and as a disciple, as a pastor in his 80s. And he's lacking no passion here. Perhaps his passion is growing here. And he is not seeing it in the life of the church. He's watching those he loves so dearly be tempted by false teachers, be tempted by false doctrine. He's seeing those whom he loves become so lackadaisical in their faith. He's, he's watching them. It, it, I mean, think about this. If, if you've been around, you've been following Jesus for a while, or you have children or grandchildren, you watch them and you watch people come tell them things that aren't true, and you're like, you just want to take a big stick or a baseball bat and you just want to go hit the people who are telling them wrong things. I'm like, no, stop. Get it together. Get back in line. Stay in the right lane. Let's go. Like, this is the passion he's, he's illustrating here in this letter is, we know this. That which is from the beginning, guys. You know this. You know the gospel. Most of you saw it. Most of you witnessed it. Some of you were sitting on the hillside when Jesus fed 20,000 plus people out of nothing. I mean, how do you get over that? How do you forget that? Some of you saw Lazarus. You know that he was dead. And, in, and Mary and Martha told us he was going to stink when we showed up on the scene. And all of a sudden, Lazarus comes walking out of the tomb and he was all bound up like a mummy. You saw saw what is and, and, and you, you grandparents you know this and you talk to your children like what are you thinking you know the truth get it together guys 
get it together. That's the passion that he's bringing to this. He's like, get it together. John's not writing this because he got bored. This was his retirement package. You know what I'm saying? Like some pastors decide, okay, we've got to work on our retirement plan, so we're going to write books. This isn't his plan here. He's writing this at a distinct passion and love because this is... This is what he cares about. The gospel is this important. And he's, he's looking at this and he's compelled to speak truth. And it's not just because the world is going to go to hell. We know that. But it's because the church is losing your first love. The people in the church are losing sight of what it means to worship. What it means to say, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. Right here, right now. Not just when Jesus shows up. But your kingdom come. Your will be done right here, right now. On earth as it is in heaven, this message is an extremely relevant message to you and I this morning, this very day, as we sit here and we should be reminded whether we are 10 or whether we are 95, that the cry of our hearts should be the love of our Father. And when something distorts, when something comes in and starts distorting the truth, when we look around and see our family losing sight of the kingdom, our hearts should break and we should be compelled to step up and to step out and start screaming from the roof types, No! No! This type of distortion has been happening since the very beginning. Genesis 3, Satan walks up to Adam and Eve and says, Did God really say, in 2018, people come into the church and say, Did God really say, we've been fighting the same temptation for all of time. So disciples of Christ should be able to stand up and say, No! God said this, and this is all that matters. Stay in the lines. Stay in the lines. We should be walking loudly and boldly, loving the children of God, demonstrating the continuous love of God until he takes us out. We don't get a pass. <clears throat> Retirement comes along and so God gives you more time to shout out, no, stay in the lines. Love Jesus. Love God more. We, we make disciples better because we have more time. We cannot deny the temptation of the church to want to attract more people in with messages that are light on the Bible, light on the gospel. Baptist churches in this valley are facing the very same temp 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 temptations. And we have been for decades. It's not a 2018 thing. It's been 40 plus years, 100 years. If we, if we, if we take easy here, if we take it easy here where Jesus says you have to forsake this and forsake this maybe we can attract more people and if we do more messages that are, that are easier here, address this or address this, we'll be able to fill up this room. If we do that we're just going to end up condemning more people. What do we want to be about? Do we want to be about people loving Jesus or about attracting more people and we have to be about loving God ultimately. Loving God ultimately. What is happening here at this moment in First John is the church is facing, get this, two distinct heresies. Now this is where it would have been nice to have a note-taking sheet this morning, so I'm going to try to slow it down and let's be real. The church in First John is facing two distinct heresies. Two distinct heresies that we face today as well. They were happening in the first century. They're happening in the 21st century. Two distinct heresies. There were the, on the one hand we had the Gnostics. I'm sure most of you have heard these words before. The Gnostics. It starts with a G-N-O. Okay, if you're one of those taking notes, it's a G-N-O type of thing. Or you can just write Gnostics. N-O. That's what I would have done. Gnostics. They were the prototypes for what we call today the New Age Movement. It's been around for a really long time, obviously, since 80, 80, 89. On the other hand, we had the Materialists. And obviously we can understand what they relate to. The Gnostics believed that only the spiritual was real. And the physical wasn't real. It wasn't real at all. The physical was just an illusion. So you and I, this, you can just put your hand through it. It's just fake. It's all going to pass away. Only the spiritual is real. The materialist, so the Gnostics believe only the spiritual is real. So if you're taking notes and we're breaking this down, the Gnostics believe only the spiritual is real. The materialist on the opposite side of the spectrum believe only the physical is real. The spiritual is just an illusion. So they're opposites. And so we have the same people today teaching the same things. The New Age movement, the Gnostics say. So the New Age movement and the Gnostics are the same type of people. So if you see people talking about the New Age movement in 2018, they're the same thing as the Gnostics. 
So the Gnostics say you can create your own reality. All this is just an illusion. The physical isn't important. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. What we do here with our physical bodies doesn't matter. You only live once. That whole thing kind of comes out of the whole Gnostic movement belief because whatever you do in this life is just kind of a, a flat line. It really doesn't matter. All of this is just an illusion. The physical shouldn't concern us. This is what the Gnostics are saying. Therefore, they would not agree that God could become flesh. This is where it gets really important. The Gnostics did not believe and they were infiltrating the church here saying that God could not become flesh and they just wouldn't believe it. And so for us being here in this church saying that we believe in Jesus, if God can't become flesh, it really throws into question John 1 14. It really throws into question 1 John 1. You see what I'm saying? You see we have a, we have a fundamental problem here because if John didn't become, if John, if Jesus didn't become flesh, who restores us to relationship with God? we're all still condemned to going to hell. You see, you see the fundamental problem here if we, we follow the New Age movement path? Because somebody has to come and crush the head of the serpent. We see it in Genesis 3. Somebody has to come and, and, and be the substitutionary atoning factor for our sins. Are we all on the same page on that? It matters. It matters. Okay. On the other hand, the materialist, for entirely different re reasons, could believe that Jesus Christ was a great guy and that he was in the flesh, but they would not believe, get this, so Jesus could be real. He could, they could believe that he came in the flesh. They could believe that he died, but he didn't raise from the dead. Okay? So the Gnostics believe that Jesus couldn't come in the flesh. The materialists believe he could have come in the flesh. That's all good. That's kosher. Probably shouldn't say that here. But it, it works. But he couldn't raise from the dead because they didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the supernatural. Okay, so what's our fundamental problem with this one? If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then we're all still dead in our sins. Okay, so we, we have a fundamental problem with the Gnostics. And we have a fundamental problem with the materialist. But these were the two main teachings infiltrating the church in the latter half of the first century that John is addressing here. Friends, I think in 2018, we have extremely similar issues in the church today along with gender issues, along with marriage issues, along with, I mean, we, we, we could fill up the words at about an eight-point font. Words that compromise the gospel. So, the Gnostics say the spiritual was real. The other says the physical was real. As a result, John comes forward right now and he says, on the one hand, the doctrine of the incarnation destroys the Gnostic approach. It says God became human. That was subjective reality. You can't just create reality in your own way. This is not a world of illusion. On the other hand, the doctrine of the resurrection destroys the materialistic view. And so it matters. John says, we saw it. We saw what's happening here. First John 1, 500 people saw it. Eyewitnesses saw the resurrection. They're still around. He's saying, go talk to the witnesses. They haven't all died off yet. They haven't all died off. So here we are right now, you and I back at this moment, at this pivotal juncture. The massive takeaway here, a massive point for us all is how we live, how we say what we say, what we believe matters. The coexist movement, the live and let be thought process is a wash. The things that we say, the way that we read our Bibles, the way that we teach from the Bible, it matters for a right understanding of Scripture is vastly important. Lest we come back around to Genesis 3 where we're tempted to say, did God really say this is how we come to wrong interpretations of marriage? This is how we come to an incorrect and absolutely abhorrent interpretation of sin, grace, and love. So many other things that are culture is attempting to redefine for us just as it did years after the resurrection of Christ. This is not a random message, but a cry of faith, a call to fall more deeply in love with the king, to dive deeper, to love more, to speak more, get this, to speak more, and to remember to not lose faith. For here, as John is writing his appeal, it is to those who would have been witnesses to the resurrection. Remember, he's not just blankly writing to people on the hillside. He's writing to people in the church, people who would have been around, people who would have... Because remember, when did the 
Crucifixion happened. The time of Passover. So the reality is most of the Jews were in town for Passover to celebrate Passover. Most of the first converts we understand from Acts came at the time of Pentecost and so they were there. They were witnesses. They saw it. And so they would have been there. They were not just passive listeners to the world, but they were first-hand witnesses. So if first-hand witnesses are struggling with the gospel, we have to believe that in 2018, people who hear, repent, and believe are going to be tempted. Satan is going to use this tactic to get back into us. So we have to stand on the truth. This is a warning to us. If you can see the king, witness the miracles of the king, and be led astray, let us heed warning and lean in more. Let us seek the face more readily. Let's not put Put off the consumption of our daily bread. Let us be diligent about reading the word, knowing the word, studying the word, gathering together for worship, singing the word, praying the word. Let us be a people who seek coming together, not say, oh, I've got to go to church today because it's what we do on Sunday. Let's be a people who say, let's get in so that we can, we can be prepared to do battle. Let us be a people who get in so that we can say, let's go out and make disciples because the kingdom matters. The word matters. Let us be about knowing God. Knowing God, we have far too many frivolous conversations, even in the church, about things that have nothing to do with eternity and encouraging the saints or spreading the gospel to the lost. Are these not just tactics of the devil and the evil one to distract us from our one mission? Is this not the work of the serpent saying, did God not say? Think about the conversations we have in the church. Think about the conversations we have about the church. Do they matter in the realm of eternity? What consumes our time and our words? Are we wasting words at the expense of eternity? Are we wasting words at the expense of the gospel? Friends, let us hear the message this morning, the singular message. The faith of which we hold to matters. The true message of the gospel matters. There is no room for negotiating on the gospel. But when we negotiate on the gospel, we open up to perhaps Jesus did not come in the flesh. And we say, Chad, we're not near that. But when we start negotiating on one thing, how many steps does it take to get there? When we start peeling away a layer here, how many steps does it take to get? Perhaps, perhaps we, perhaps. When we start negotiating one place, it's ultimately going to lead us somewhere else then we are the ones to lose. For the crux of our salvation is that Christ came. He came to fulfill the covenant. He came to fulfill the promise to Eve. He came to fulfill the promises passed through all of the Old Testament. He came to restore us to himself. Get this, John is going to get this in later. First John 3, 1. He came that we should be called children of God. And get this, so we are. That's good. He came that we should be called children of God. What we do, what we say, how we work, the way we conversate among other believers, the words we use, the thought process that we allow to run through our minds, it matters. It matters. The things that we consume on TV, the things, the way that we do things, it matters. But we have two more verses. First John 1, 3. That which we have seen and we have heard, we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Just quickly think back to the seven days after the first Easter in the upper room at night. Jesus' disciples had gathered together, most of them kind of panicking and freaking out. And suddenly Jesus appeared in the midst, what we would assume or what I would interpret from my broken theology, Jesus walked through the wall and what did Jesus do and say? He showed them his hands. He showed them his hands, his side and his feet and he told them to touch him and we see in Luke 24, 39, he showed them that he was there. Maybe John was thinking back to that night, now 50 or 60 years earlier, when he was there in that upper room and suddenly Jesus appeared and John saw him and hugged him and rejoiced with him and talked to him. And he says, we touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the word of the resurrection. And Jesus calls, uh, John calls Jesus the word. And in John 1, 1, and again in Revelation 19, 13, John calls Jesus the life. In John eleven twenty five, 25, in the context of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus is the word of life because he gives life. He alone can save us from our sins and give us eternal life. And now, John stresses the historical reality of the incarnation of Jesus in, in verse 1 of John, 1 John 1, 1, and all other issues he will speak to 
and the letter hinge on this crucial truth that God has become man in the person of Christ. And the fact is this, this truth, this fortress from which John will defend the church against all those false teachers who have denied Christ has come in the flesh. But not just that, but it matters on how we relate to each other. It matters on how we speak to each other. It matters on why we gather. It matters on what we do. It matters what we proclaim. It matters what we believe. Think about this. No matter our political divide, Democrat, Republican, I said it here. I said the D word. No matter our racial divide, no matter our financial background, no matter how we were raised, whether we were wealthy or poor, there's something that unites people of God who believe the true gospel. Get this, we are united by the power of the gospel that pulls each and every one of us. Don't miss this. We are united by the power of the gospel that pulls each and every one of us from the point of destruction and places us in the midst of the king. We are at the moment of death. And the gospel pulls us from death and places us in the midst of the king, places in the moment when we are called sons and daughters of God. Maybe I'm the only one who gets excited about that. That sounds pretty good to me because I know my history. I know the dirt in my life. I know that I deserve nothing other than utter destruction. And he pulls us from that moment of destruction and says... Come be with me. There is something that bonds all believers for all eternity. It's not history. It's not language. It's not style. It's not dress or nation. It's not the fact that we can do something, but it's the fact that we are pulled out of death and brought to life. And it's not by our power, but the power of him alive and working in us. So here in verse 3, John brings us back to fellowship. And John points the church in Asia Minor and the church right here in the valley to put aside the disparities and to cling to the thing that unites us. For we are not a people of the city. We are not a people of the 21st century. We are not white. We are not black. We are not Hispanic. We are not Democrats. We are not Republicans. We are sons and daughters of the king. Check that. We are an eternal people, a royal priesthood created for all eternity. So get this, let's stick with me. Let's wake up for just a few more minutes. We're getting there, we're almost done. When we are feeling down, when we are lonely, when the world is caving in, when we are feeling that we don't have a purpose, we are sons and daughters of the King. When things are not going our way, when we can't remember who we are or where we come from. We have a family bond that should be stronger in this room than the blood relatives in our life and in our family who are not believers. Because we can relate better because we are speaking the same language. We are speaking the language of our king. We are speaking the language of eternity. We are not wasting words or time because we realize that we are united with those people who have gone before. Hebrews 11 because we have such a great cloud of witnesses. What does that mean? It means that we have people on our side in eternity who are on our side. We are united with them for all of eternity. We're not just passing by when people pass on. It means that it is our job. It is our purpose now to keep going on until he says, boom, you're done, you're here. We are speaking the language of all eternity. And when we move on, when it is our time to step into the realms of eternity, we speak the same language. We don't have to learn something new, but we are there. We are part of that. We will be able to relate. Why? Because we are part of the kingdom. We are his children, and we will be able to relate. Just as my daughters are able to relate to each other because they are our daughters, we will be able to relate to our brothers and sisters in the same way because we are coming to and continue the mission that Jesus has given us. We speak the language of the church in the first century that John is speaking to. We have the struggles and we can relate to them and we can understand we are not removed. We will not be removed from the church in the 22nd century if Jesus chooses to wait that long. We will be able to relate to them when we gather together around the table. We will be able to say, I understand. I can carry that burden. It is not a disparagement of technology or disparagement of 
automobiles or anything else that we can say, well, we can't relate. No, we can relate. We can relate exactly. It's not about politics. It's not about culture. It's about the fact that we are part of the kingdom. Get this. When we understand Matthew 28, 18, he gave it in the first century. It's relevant to today. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And when he says to me, he's talking about to himself. And with that, he says, now go. And as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe all that I've commanded, and I'm with you always. He's with us always. He was with them in the first century. He's with us today. He's going to be with us as long as he chooses to let us be here. But we don't get a bypass. We don't retire from this ministry. We don't retire from this work. Jesus says in John 15, 25, this is my commandment that you, commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I call you friends. Friends, for all that I have, have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Here Jesus expresses that his attitude toward disciples in his final days for his crucifixion. Notice the conjunction here of the commandment. Love friendship, and making known the truth from the Father. Fellowship. So as we go about this room, you say, well, you're from Mississippi, and that's like a foreign country. We well, are from Colorado in the desert. Let's just be real. And y'all had John as a pastor from Arkansas. Now let's just talk about Arkansas for a minute. Amen. <laughs> like, Seriously. Like, they, got, they call them the hill people. But you know what? We can all speak the same language because we're united by the king. And it doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter if we're from East Asia, South Asia, from Russia. It doesn't matter if we're from London or from Boston or from Mississippi or Arkansas or from Grand Junction. It matters that we're part of the kingdom. It matters. And we can be here and we can be of one family because we're of the kingdom. We're of the kingdom. And he has made himself known to us. And he has called us his children. 1 John 3, 1. So be it. It's an absolute. It's not a debatable issue. Verse 4. And this is just good. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is not an afterthought as we conclude this morning, but this is a huge thought. John writes that our joy may be complete, and this is a significant passage for each and every one of us. For We live in a day and age with a 24-hour lousy news cycle. We live in a time where we have instant access to another scandal, something else happening, some other tragedy, but here John points us to joy. Not the word happiness, but to joy, lasting joy, the understanding of what it means to be consumed, to be filled by the King, to know God. Joy is the presence of Jesus in our lives by means of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Joy describes a reality in life of genuine, get this, joy describes a reality in our life of genuine satisfaction. Genuine satisfaction intellectually, genuine satisfaction emotionally, genuine satisfaction spiritually. Joy is a spirit of exaltation regardless of the circumstances that we're facing in life, regardless of the things that you feel impending. We go back to what we were just talking about in the fellowship. Regardless of how and why we feel lonely, joy is a sense of the supernatural strength that only comes from the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We see that in Nehemiah 8.10. When we come and we know the gospel, we can refute the false teachings. When we can truly know that fellowship points to the kingdom, Get this, we know that fellowship comes from being a kingdom people. We know joy. We know joy. We don't assume joy. We don't look for happiness. We know joy. Why? Because no matter what happens, no matter how fast the false churches grow, no matter how fast the world seems to be falling down around us, we know that before Ephesians 1, before the foundation of the world, our salvation was, was secure. We know. We can read James 1.4 and let the steadfastness have its full effect that we may be made perfect and that we may be made complete, lacking in 
nothing. We can have joy because we know God and because we are united and carry these burdens together. And perhaps one of my favorite passages now, this is probably a lie, so forgive me already in, 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 in retrospect, but a great passage in Exodus, Exodus 3, 14. And God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel and let us be reminded of this. Put this on your wall, paint it on your house. I don't care, but remember this. I am has sent me to, to you. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This this is my name forever. And thus, I will be remembered throughout all generations. Now, let me just tell you, all generations is a really, 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 really long time. You know what I'm saying? That is a promise that no matter what happens in our lives, we can have joy because God is God, is God, is God, is God, and will be God for all eternity. And there's not a generation that will ever be born on this planet who won't know that God is God. That's good. That's real good. John 17. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All are mine and yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction, that the scripture may be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they, get this, these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for your sake, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in truth. Let's pray together.